Oh ragazzi, 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 ce l'abbiamo fatta, siamo tornati, siamo tornati alla grande. Perché? Perché con questo episodio di Elite Club ripartiamo dopo un'estate in cui ce la siamo presa un po' comoda con un ospite internazionale. Quindi, come sempre accade durante i momenti in cui abbiamo degli ospiti internazionali, non sarò da solo, ma sarò aiutato anche dal nostro caro Roberto, il quale ci aiuterà ovviamente a fare delle domande, a rendere il tutto più fluido e chiaramente, giustamente, poi noi creeremo tutti i sottotitoli adeguati per farvi capire e comprendere qualsiasi parola verrà detta durante questa intervista. Ovviamente oggi abbiamo pensato di fare una cosa bella, 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 cioè chiamare un giornalista americano, un giornalista di Bleacher Report, quindi un sito molto, molto, molto importante, non soltanto un sito ovviamente, ma anche un provider di pay per view e tante altre cose, quindi abbiamo una persona che è sicuramente non solo capace, ma anche molto, molto, molto competente alla quale faremo qualche domanda ovviamente inerente al mondo delle notizie e il mondo della IW nello specifico. Quindi tenetevi forte, da questo momento in poi parleremo soltanto in inglese, ma non temete, è un'intervista che va bene per tutti, proprio grazie al nostro lavoro di sottotitoli. Quindi a tra poco. And we are here. New episode of Elite Club, and we are here. This is Stefano, the voice of AEW Italian Podcast, alongside with my friend Rob. Hello, Rob, how are you? Hey, Stefano, how are you doing? Thank you for having me here. I'm uh, very pleased to have you, but I'm very, very pleased to have here Chris Muller, that is a journalist of professional wrestling for Lisa Report. Thank you very much, Chris. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you having me. It's very important for us to have you here because it's uh, the first time we have a journalist uh, from United States. So it's very, it's a big pleasure for us because we are going to ask you something about uh, the being a journalist, being so near to the action, to wrestlers, to the companies. And uh, it's very, very interesting having you here. So the first question is uh, when And most importantly, how did you become a journalist in this uh, crazy but wonderful world of professional wrestling? I started writing for Bleacher Report almost 13 years ago now. It'll be 13 years in October. And when I first started, Bleacher Report wasn't a big site. It was kind of just an open platform blog almost. So anyone could sign up and write and at a certain point the website got big and took off and they luckily asked me to stay on as a paid writer and keep going and it just kind of grew from there i've written for a couple other outlets around here and there but i've mainly been at bleacher report for the past 13 years So a long, long time. Yeah. Can can we speak as you as a veteran in this uh, job? I mean, there's a lot of people out there who've been doing this longer than me, but yeah, I mean, I've been around for a little while now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So go on, Rob, if you have something to ask him. Well, um, so I would say uh, before um, I we did this we we're doing this interview like i did a little bit of research and i found out that you did uh a great interview to tony khan so how how did you come about to interview the one of the most influencer person in the wrestling industry how do you how do you approach that um i just approach it like i'm talking to anybody tony is just a guy Uh, I'm lucky enough to where Bleacher Report has a relationship with AEW since we broadcast their pay-per-views through our service. So I have close relationships with all of the media people over there. And yeah, I mean, you know, when I found that after the first couple times I talked to pro wrestlers and people in the industry, they're just people. So, you know, you just have a conversation with them and they'll end up giving you good answers. Yeah. And what, now that you interviewed Tony Khan, like, um, did you get a feel of who he is and like how he approaches the 
the wrestling industry versus maybe other promoters that you might have interviewed like what what have you noticed that he's doing great or maybe not great what do you what do you thoughts on that well i've talked to tony a couple of times uh that was actually our second interview with bleacher report i did one uh way back last year around the one year anniversary of the company and so this year we tried to set it up for another one around the two year anniversary which also happened to kind of fall around all out which was lucky for me yeah um the thing i think he's doing the best is he's managing to do long-term storylines without repeating the same matches over and over and over we're getting a good variety of different lineups every week like yeah we've seen the lucha bros and the young bucks face each other four or five times but that's over the course of two years you know sometimes wwe will put the same match five times in a month so yeah. you, you have to give him credit for using the roster size that he has in interesting ways like like we just saw mjf go from feuding with the one of the biggest names in the company and chris jericho to feuding with brian pillman jr who is arguably still a rookie in this business so i, I like the way he's using the roster and kind of matching people up just who he knows are going to work together as far as i mean i don't i wouldn't say that i know tony khan is like a person i've had very limited interaction with him you know we've maybe had a few hours of conversation total over the years and the only impression i get from him is that he's just a genuinely nice guy and he really does want this to work for the talent I don't think he's in this for selfish reasons. I think this is a dream come true for him. And he's going to put every bit of effort that he has into this to make it work. Oh, it's great. And uh, the, the, the first question that came up to me right now is, but did you interview someone else? And what are the feelings of uh, other people inside AEW that maybe you talked about or talked with? I mean, I've I've gotten a chance to interview most of the big names in the company, like Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, Adam Page is coming up here soon. Uh, I'll be talking to Brian Danielson this week. I've gotten to talk to Britt Baker, Cody, and Brandy. Um, and I think the main thing that I've gotten from everybody is that they're all just really excited about having another major outlet for pro wrestling, especially in the United States where it's really been a one dog fight for the last 20 years with WWE. So having this new company is exciting. And I really get the impression that everybody is just excited to try to make it work. And it's kind of a, it's more of a team effort than everybody sort of working towards their individual goals, which you don't see that in professional sports very often when it comes to these kinds of things. And, I I get a feeling that you know after hearing and listening to all these wrestlers that came into AW and they either spoke on unrestricted or other outlets they all say the same thing the locker room seems to have this energy this environment and it gives me this feeling that AW is a company done by wrestlers for the wrestlers Versus maybe the competition is done by a corporation for a wrestler that might be a little bit different, don't you think? Yeah, and having so many active pro wrestlers in their EVP positions, their executive vice president positions, is probably why you get that feeling. Because it really is wrestlers doing this for wrestlers, so... I don't think there's a lot of selfishness going around in AEW. I really do think that everybody is there for a common good. And we're seeing that in the product because so many people are starting to look at AEW as that's the hot place to be. Yeah, <laughs> we can we can see, we can see. But um, a question that I, I really like to, to ask you is... Uh, how is difficult to have some news inside news from AEW because I think they are uh, very closed. Uh, they can keep secrets, and uh, I think that 
maybe lots of people there knows things, but they don't speak out from their environment, how difficult it is. I think for them, it's probably not that difficult because for them, it's just, you know, these are the things that I shouldn't talk about. Like Brody Lee, for example, CM Punk specifically noted how the fact that they all respected Brody's privacy during that time and that never got out to any of the news outlets. Now, for me personally, I'm not a news guy, so I don't look for that inside information or spoilers or anything like that and i don't ask people to give them to me so i don't tend to have as much of that background information as somebody like a dave Meltzer or a sean ross sap who part of their job is to break news and for me it's i'm more of an analyst slash interviewer like i've specialized in live coverage for a long time and now i'm starting to do a lot of interviews and that's what I would prefer to focus on. So I never have the burden of having to keep these secrets that everybody would want to know, you know, you, you don't want none of that. <laughs> no, I, I really don't. Honestly. I mean, if it ever came to where somebody did spill something to me, I don't think I'd have a problem keeping it secret, but right. yeah, I'm kind of glad that I'm not in that position. Yeah. It, it, it's really, I feel like it's, um, awesome the way that AEW handled uh, Brody Lee's privacy because I, me as a fan I found out about that through their tweet their statement and I was completely caught off guard but I feel like majority of the fa fan base got caught off guard and, and which means that they handle it very very well so it's remarkable yeah it was a really it was a really sad thing to find that out because you know, you, you expect to know everything about these people's lives because so many people just publish every detail of their life on social media. And, I, you know, we were all curious, like, where did Brody go after he lost the TNT title? Why are they not using him on TV? Like, there were people who were complaining, like, look at what AEW's doing to Brody. They're wasting him. And then we find out that he's been in the hospital for two months. And, yeah, yeah it was heartbreaking, but... At the same time, it was nice to know that that entire locker room and office, anyone who knew, just was able to keep that to themselves. Because you just, you don't see that kind of stuff. Like, we all knew what was going on with Roman Reigns a day or two before he made that announcement. And you just didn't see that with Brody Lee. It was, it was very nice. Yeah, it was definitely very tight-lipped. Stefano, go ahead. Oh yeah, I have a question about uh, not news now, but uh, interviews. How difficult it is for you to have uh, those kind of people there who want to become uh, superstars and maybe they are becoming superstars, but they have always, always, always a big number of uh, haters who gives, who throws shit on AW, AW booking and everything. Do you feel that they want to do something more or you think they are normal people who wants to work very hard to become superstars? I think it's different with each person. Most of the people I've talked to just do seem like they genuinely love the pro wrestling business and this is their passion. But I have also talked to people who have aspirations in Hollywood and music and all these other things and it's uh it's really just comes down to you know all these people are just people like i don't think most of them see themselves as celebrities even though they're they know they're famous and they know people know who they are i think most pro wrestlers they kind of view themselves as being like a niche celebrity like some people will know who they are but they could probably go to starbucks and maybe not get recognized so um i i think it's easy to talk to these people once once you get over like any kind of fanboy feelings you have like when i got to interview sting that was the closest i came to being nervous to talking to somebody <laughs> because i've been watching sting since i was a kid and five minutes into the conversation i'm i'm totally at ease because he's put me at ease by the fact that he's just a normal dude. 
Yeah. I I had a sort of the same feeling uh, when I ran into Sammy Guevara for a show. Uh, I had the like I literally parked next to his car, <laughs> and I and yeah, like he was unloading his stuff. I was like, hey man, like can we take a picture? I was like, oh yeah, yeah, sure, man. Like I I really appreciated this humbleness of him and it, it's crazy who he is in the ring and versus who he was in that parking lot and, yeah. you know I'll, I'll say the same thing about him i actually because i've interviewed sammy and i thought the exact same thing he came off as far more humble over the phone when i was talking to him than his character and he acknowledged that his character is a far cry from who he really is as a person but uh yeah i think it's like that with most of these people like malachi black i just talked to him last month just really nice guy really cool dude uh you know he's not all dark and dreary like his character he's he's a very smart guy actually like when i was talking to him i was really impressed with how much thought he had put into every aspect of his character like he was basing the look off of of his new mask off of some celtic deity like he's really going deep with this stuff and trying to come up with something unique and it was really it was really cool yeah and how how difficult it is for you to interview people that uh, on screen are something that they created sometimes they are very different from uh, real life, as we mentioned, Sammy Gibar, for example, or Malachi Black. And sometimes they are very similar to what they bring to the table. For example, MJF. I don't know if you ever had the possibility to interview him, but uh, he's very similar, I think, from real life and, and character. How differences do you, you catch with this? I think it comes down to whether they're working as a heel or baby face. Cause most of these people in real life are, are, would come across as baby faces. Like when I was talking to Brandy Rhodes, I think her character was a little more of a heel at the time. But when I was talking to her, she was nothing but a sweetheart. So, you know, it's, it is what it is with some people wanting to stay in character during their interviews a little bit more. Um, I can respect that with characters like MJF, who he is in character 24-7. Like, you go on his Twitter, you never see him interacting with people in a different way than he would as his character, which is a very old-school approach that I like. I uh, haven't had a chance to interview him yet. He's actually one I'm a little nervous to talk to because I'm <laughs> curious how similar he will be to his character. But uh, it'll it'll be fun. I'll let you guys know when that happens. Oh yeah, please do. Like, <laughs> I want to see that. I I, I actually want to see one day MJF without his you know his in ring persona. Like, I want to see. I'm not <laughs> sure there is an MJF without the in ring persona. Like, I'm sure he can be a nice guy, but I get the feeling that like a lot of wrestlers that's just a slight exaggeration of how he really is. Like, he might not be as much of a jerk, but I bet you he's just as confident as he is with that character right. yeah I, I saw an interview when he was very very young in a tv show and it was very similar to this kind of mjf and it's it's crazy because he was like four years old and now 20 and more years later is the same but with the language and uh, uh, the body language of today and <laughs> crazy crazy person I, I want to ask you something uh, about uh, your job. What do you think about the possibility of other countries, maybe Italy, for example, us? We have a, a small website and sometimes we have uh, to write news and uh, uh, report some uh, interviews from uh, the United States because the wrestling we, we know and we follow is in the United States. So what is your relationship with uh, people who take your work and uh, translate it, uh, putting you as um, the reference, okay? Not uh, um, robbing uh, what, what you did uh, for, for your living. But uh, um, so what is your relationship with your work outside United States to the world wild? 
Uh, I mean, for specific websites, I've actually done a little work with Sports Kita, which is based in India, and I've done a little work with What Culture over in the UK. Um, as far as other websites picking up my work, I mean, as as long as they credit me and Bleacher Report, I love it. I mean, it's it's great to get more circulation on that stuff, and anyone who's willing to take the time to translate it to another language, I mean, that's just as much work as I'm putting into it. So I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I've had issues with some websites where they'll just credit Bleacher Report and not list me by name. And it's it's kind of funny to read because it's like, you know, it, Bleacher Report is not a sentient website that conducts interviews. There's a person doing that. And I think, I think that's something that every person in our field has to fight for is, is just getting the proper credit and i think it's a basic common courtesy where if you're using anyone else's information you just list their name and link to it and that's the best you can hope for at this point but i've had a really good relationship with a lot of websites that have you know picked up my work and stuff and i think it's great as long as they you know link to the original interview and don't claim that they did it instead of me then everything's all good for me yeah we we live in a, in a strange country about this um, <laughs> this kind of things because in italy we 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 don't do this uh, so often sometimes it's like uh, italian websites have the news just like that because uh, i don't know santa claus uh, brought them the news and it's not correct for me and you know we have a, a content on our youtube site that it's called beyond the aw where i listen to the, the aw unrestricted podcast and then i speak in italian obviously um and i, I make a, a little review to three facts but i always say to the people go ahead go further and go there listen to the words listen to the podcast because it's very important for you to understand no mine is just a minus work just to let your attention go raise up to go there to to the original content what do you think about uh, this possibility of creating a bigger web a bigger uh, way to, to 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 spread the news I mean, I, I love it that there's people out there like you who will do that stuff because it it creates a bigger international fan base for AEW and any of these companies. So the fact that you're willing to spend your time doing that for the Italian fans is awesome. Thank you. And I'm a big fan of promoting other people's work. I don't think that there should be a feeling of competition among people online because we're not working in an, a zero sum environment where you have only so much to go around like for example tv ratings they, those work off of what's watched live so you have different channels they're competing with each other but two youtube channels aren't competing with each other because people can watch their videos at any time and it's the same amount of revenue because it's just about minutes watched so it's the same thing with my line of work with articles there are tons of great wrestling websites out there that i support some of them i've uh, been asked to write for and done a little bit of work some of them i've never written for i just think they do good work so i think it's it's nice when people have that supportive environment of collaboration and you know, just going out there and supporting somebody else's work through your work, I think is a great thing. I really support anyone who wants to go out and do that. And I, I really feel what you say because I can see it here. I live in the States and I see how like different outlets, they, they kind of support each other. But, you know, you definitely don't get that feeling of competition. While in Italy, it's the polar opposite. Like, uh, they they try to be the next Meltzer or the next whoever. They try to break news when instead it's just like uh, news that they heard of on Twitter or whatever. And and it's just 
that the best. And uh, so Italy right now, in terms of uh, journalism, it's not the best scene. But then you have other little realities like us. We like to do an honest job because I feel like we have ambitions. We strive to do a great job. So the least we can do is to credit people when we do articles and news or even content like Stefan does. So now, what what do you think from here? Like after this big expansion of EW, like what do you see next? What what do you see the direction of EW at this point? Well, my hope is that this year they're able, or early next year, they're able to start doing a little bit of international touring. I think that that's the next big step for them. They haven't hit every market in the U.S. yet because the pandemic stopped them. Six months into their TV deal is when all that hits. So they're really still just getting their feet wet again with live touring. And, you know, the United States is a mess right now as far as what locations have what regulations. So I feel like once they're able to safely travel internationally, that's when we're going to start to see this fan base grow. Because once you can go see something live, you have much more reason to be invested in the weekly product as well. And that's one of the things WWE has done so well for so long is like twice a year they do a tour of Europe or Australia or Asia or wherever. And that's really the next big step for AEW is international. So once, once they get their TV deals in place and once they're able to start safely getting in and out of other countries that i think that's when we're really going to start to see a little bit of a shake up here if you if you happen to speak with tony khan again let let him know that the italian fan base is growing like hell like i will <laughs> i mean i know that he's he's wanted to get over to europe since the start and they know that a lot of their big talents come from europe so yeah, I don't think it's going to be too much longer. I think there probably will be a European tour sometime in the next six months to a year at some point. I think it's just a matter of time. Now, we hope so. <laughs> uh, per, from a personal standpoint, allow me to ask you one last question. Um, you were at All Out a couple of weeks ago. Yes. How was that experience being there? Oh, it was great. Uh, I hadn't been to any kind of big live event in probably a year and a half just because of all the pandemic stuff. So that in itself was nice to kind of just get out there and actually see people again and feel that energy. But just the amount of stuff they packed into that show was amazing. Like, I, I think the loudest reaction I heard all night, believe it or not, was for the Lucha Brothers win. And I know Adam Cole, Brian Danielson, like they got big reactions, but I swear that building shook a little bit when the Lucha <laughs> Bros won because the Chicago area has a very strong Spanish population. We have a lot of Hispanic people here and they went nuts. And it was such a cool moment to witness. Um, I think my personal favorite was seeing ruby soho i'm a i'm a big fan of hers and the reaction that she got in chicago was so great people were chanting her name before the music even yep. started you could see her almost starting to tear up there because she was just so happy to finally get the she's finally being treated like the star that she is i, I keep so yeah, it was a special night. I'm I'm really happy that I went. I met a lot of great people that night, both in and out of my field, and got to hang out with some of them. Uh, some of my friends from Bleacher Report came into town for it, so I, I, I had a great time. And I encourage anybody who's never seen a live show to go give it a shot because there's nothing like it. Yeah, uh, I actually been to two Dynamite show, and I have a ticket for an upcoming um rampage in st louis but i wanted to go to full gear knowing that it wasn't st louis but now it's not gonna be but i'm trying to go wh wherever it's gonna be uh and uh i hope i run into you man like <laughs> yeah that would be great i probably won't be at full gear uh but 
pretty much any big show that's going to be in the Chicago area, that's probably where I'll be. All right. Good deal, man. Stefano? Okay, no, I, I, I want to I want to thank you, Chris, because it was a, a great, great pleasure to have you here. And uh, we hope uh, to bring you back maybe uh, later this year or maybe next year to speak about, again, big news about uh, AW and your beautiful work with your interviews. And maybe next time we are going to ask you about people. <laughs> we didn't, but... Uh, you know some of them so maybe we are going to ask you what are your um, ideas about people who works there in aw so be prepared yeah sure guys anytime just reach out and i'd be happy to come back i mean if you want you can always drop in a little scoop if you got one for us <laughs> oh i i like i said man i avoid back <laughs> backstage kind of news like there was a when i was talking to tony there was this thought in my head like should i ask him to just like give me some exclusive or something like that and then i just decided not to because uh, you know <laughs> i i sort of don't want that to be my relationship with the company yeah because if i'm if i'm talking to them and because when i do my interviews it's it's pre-recorded and i don't publish the audio and i do that specifically because i want them to feel comfortable with the fact that if they let something slip and they tell me not to say anything about it that they know that i won't and that has happened <laughs> um i will say that i have a prediction i do think that aew is going to be doing some kind of secondary women's title soon whether that be another singles title or a tag title i don't know but I feel like with the way their women's roster has improved and expanded, there's a heavy possibility that we're going to see an increase in the amount of time that they get. It would be great. Just great because they have lots of talent. And uh, I can see between the lines that they are matching some of their superstars like Nyla Rose and Diamante or maybe Anna Jay and uh, um, Ty Conti, for example. Ellie and uh, uh, Penelope Ford. So in the next uh, future, I think uh, another tournament, maybe this time for belts. That'd be great. Something boiling. Well, Chris, yeah. thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And uh, it's really great um, to hear from a journalist standpoint, what's the outlook on the wrestling industry. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was a great pleasure. Next week we are going to be back with an Italian um, <laughs> an Italian guest. So you read all the uh, uh, all the subtitles, so you don't have you didn't have any problem here next week but in Italian. I promise you. See you next time guys. Thank you.